Good evening. Happy New Year and welcome to this evening's special meeting of the Ames City Council for January 7th, 2020. And uh, before we start, congratulations to Rowan and Tim for uh, re-election and being sworn in. And we welcome Rachel to the uh, dais tonight as our newest council member. And recognizing Amber as the uh, mayor pro tem for 2020. So we have uh, an amended agenda council. We have one item. We need a motion changing the date of the regular meeting of the Ames Conference Board from January 14th, 2020 at 5.30 p.m. to January 28th, 2020 at 5.30 p.m. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second? Second. Moved to seconded. Those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed or abstaining? Motion carried. Thank you. Okay. Well, I think many of you have been aware of the, the ongoing conversation regarding the Ames 2040 plan, and there's been limited opportunity for the public to give input to council. So tonight, we're here to listen. We want your input on um, what's been discussed this far. There are some seats here in the front if you'd like to come up front too. Um, I do have a number of cards and if you do come up, we'd like you to bring a card with you. Um, we are going to limit the time. We have quite a few people that want to address council and the way we're going to do it tonight is for, I've asked Kelly to first of all, just give us a very short synopsis of where we're at. Then we'll open up the public input and we're going to ask people to limit their comments to four minutes or less. So we can get everybody in and we'll spend about an hour on that. Then the council will have a discussion based on the, uh, what we've been talking about, engaged in, as well as your input. And then we will reopen up for public comment and, and if council has comments or questions for specific uh, individuals, we'll call you up for a little more informal this evening. Uh, our goal is to be done by nine o'clock. If we go later, we'll go later, this is an important input session and we want to hear what you have to say because next week council is making some decisions and with that i'll lead in and ask kelly to go ahead and kind of share where we're at and what council is being asked to give direction to staff next tuesday night good evening council uh, as you mentioned tonight was a is really about public input we gave you an overview of all of the content that we prepared for the scenarios back on December 19th. And we put all of that presentation information online and made notice of that availability. So we're really not gonna review any of that tonight. We're assuming the people that are here tonight had a chance to look at that information and have had a chance to become educated in what was discussed. Uh, quickly though, the scenarios were not set in stone. They were an evaluation task that council asked for. We went through and evaluated 15,000 people fitting in four different directions of the city. And then we also broke that down into tiers. So tonight I'm sure he'll comments both about the scenarios, which we're saying are the big picture 15,000 person directional issues. And then at the 19th meeting, we broke things into tiers. So you might hear people talk about tier one in the West growth area. And that would mean they're talking about a smaller percentage of the 15,000 people that city staff had looked at uh, being able to be served at either a lower cost or was already consistent with existing policy. And we had tier two and tier three, which were more midterm or had more issues that had to be resolved up front. And tier four was really a long term, maybe even beyond the scope of the plan, depending on how, how things turned out. Uh, so what we had asked the city council for and is on January 14th to move forward with the project that we, uh, that we get direction from the council on what a preferred combination of land uses are and what that means is if, if council believes that one direction of growth is is the best way to do uh, the planning for the city's future I'm sorry I lost my cursor here and I can't get this to, to go exactly how I want this to work uh, then that's the input we need to see if if city council thinks there's a combination of things that work for the city then that's what we're, we're looking for as direction on the 14th, whether it's tier one, tier two, is it west, is it north, is it east, those different combination of, of different geographies, uh, that's what we're looking for on the 14th from city council. And with that input, uh, what we have outlined here is what we showed you on December 19th. If, if you can give direction to staff and to RDG on how to move forward, then we can start to take just the geographic areas 
and start to plan for the land uses in a more concrete manner that reflects the general goals of the city for this project. Uh, the next step going forward after the 14th will be to prepare what we're calling the preferred land use map. So then we'll take these areas and we'll go back and look again at how the housing goals match, how do the commercial goals match and show you kind of a land use concept for the growth areas as well as for the whole city. Because again, we're not planning just for the growth areas, we're planning for the whole city overall. And we're gonna call that the preferred land use map. And then your next conversations will be in February where we can bring materials back to talk about the, the preferred land use map as well as the land use designations themselves and what are they gonna mean for housing types. And that's where we're gonna keep moving forward on the different topics and different chapters that are gonna go into the comprehensive plan, not just this gross scenario task that we've been working on for quite some time. So I hope that lays out what we're looking for here in the next month. And, and again, in February, will be a pretty meaningful meeting as well as we start to, to put more flesh onto the bones of the, of the plan. Okay. Gonna go back to that, uh, may I explain what you have up on the screen and what might be available to tonight. So we have the whole presentation available if, there, if questions come about specific things. I'm gonna leave this up as the backdrop for people. This map reflects RDG's um, conceptual layout of these four different areas. The yellow and orange colors represent housing development, whether it's low density or, or uh, medium or high density. The brown and the reds represent either high density development or concentrated commercial areas. And I've also highlighted on this graphic, the purple, which reflects the two employment areas that we've said that we're committed to as a city. And we haven't discussed other employment areas. We are committed to Prairie View Industrial, which is the East Industrial Park, and ISU Research Park as those, as those burgeoning job centers for us going forward. Uh, so I have those shown as well to give context to why some of these growth areas were discussed. Uh, we also have available, uh, again, we have this all available, but if someone wants to talk specifically about tiers, these maps are easy to flip up as well and talk about which tiers uh, fit in different parts of the city or within the specific growth areas themselves. Uh, if there's any other information, let me know and I'll, I'll try to get up as fast as possible. If anyone has an empty seat next to them, would you mind scooting towards the middle so then people that are still coming in can go ahead and fill in on the sides as well too. If need be, we'll open up the back wall, but it's gonna be a little disruptive as well as uh, take a few minutes to do that. But. Okay, we'll get started. Um, I'm gonna call out two names. The first name will be the person that will be invited to start uh, speaking. When you do introduce yourself, your name and your address. And then the second name will be someone who'll be basically be on deck. And that way we can get more people um, going by faster. And, uh, and then we'll just keep this flow going. So we're looking forward to hear from you. All right, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I did put a laser pointer on the, on the lectern. So if oh, someone thank you. Okay. wants to use that to point at something on a, on a graphic that's available as well. Okay, just not at us, right? Please, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Timothy Morgan, if you please come up. And then also Jonathan, I'm gonna try, uh, is it Bungie or Bun, Bun, Bungie? If you wanna come up here and just stand, uh, right where um, Robbie's uh, crouching down. We'll go ahead and get started and go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. My name is Timothy Morgan. I live at 3416 Clinton Court. I am a lifelong resident of Ames, Iowa and a graduate of Iowa State University. And in addition, I also own a small family farm just north of Ames in part of the land that is covered by the Northward Development. And I'm here today to strongly discourage you from continuing the northward development of Ames. Ames and Gilbert have a long history as strong and independent communities with their own unique and important cultures and histories. However, if the northward expansion of Ames continues, it is inevitable that Ames will engulf Gilbert and it is inevitable that it will destroy the unique and independent culture and community of Gilbert. It should be the policy of the city of Ames and the city of Gilbert, as it currently is today, to maintain a strip of farmland between Ames and Gilbert so that they can both maintain as strong and independent communities. It also happens that the strip of farmland between Ames and Gilbert is incredibly rich and productive land, much of which is still farmed by family farmers. 
it would be far better to target areas for development that are in hilly and or wooded areas, which are poorly suited for farming and are generally preferred by home buyers as they provide more scenic surroundings. It is also important to note that the area considered for Northwood expansion is much of it lies within the Ada Hayden watershed and it sits over top the Jordan aquifer. As you know, these are respectively the secondary and primary water sources for the city of Ames. If the Northwood expansion of Ames continues, there is risk that the water supply for the city of Ames will become polluted. Finally, I ask you that whatever course of action the council decides to take regarding the future expansion of Ames, make sure it is done in a moral and ethical manner. Specifically, the city of Ames should not, should never annex land from a landowner without the landowner's consent. And the city should never take land from a property owner via eminent domain. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And Mary Richards, if you, I'll go ahead. Uh, Jonathan, if you wanna start. And Mary, if you wanna come up please and uh, be prepared to follow Jonathan. Good evening, Council. Thank you for this extra meeting. Um, my name is Jonathan Bungie. I live at 226 South Maple Avenue. Um, I'm a Minnesota transplant, as you may tell from my sweatshirt tonight. I've lived in Ames for 15 years. Um, I'm one of the managers at Ace Hardware now for 10 years, and I'm a member at Cornerstone Church of Ames. Uh, my two brief questions are, um, while the city does need to grow, and I'm very appreciative of all this hard work you guys have put in and the design team has put in so far. Um, one of my random questions was just from a legal standpoint, it's great to have all these plans and know the land and what kind of ties in with the previous um, commentator, how, how few or how many private landowners do all of these different areas impact? You know, a couple people in either one of these areas putting up a fight might derail a huge section of a plan. So I'm just kind of curious, you know, has that been thought of? Does the West in fact, uh, affect five landowners? Does the East affect 10 landowners, you know, and so on and so forth? Uh, second, um, you know, there is rumors and, and uh, conversations out there that maybe a, a fleet farm will sometime come to town on the east side of Interstate 35 along 13th Street. Um, I think if I remember reading some of the documents that the eastern expansion is some of the most expensive because it is it has the least um, easy connections to current infrastructure. How would, if a store of that size come to the east side of 35, how would that maybe diminish the overall costs of the eastern project and suddenly the eastern project would become a lot cheaper than some of the other geographical areas projects because the city is already going to start footing the bill for those types of city services to cross the interstate. So uh, thank you for this time. Uh, thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Jonathan. Mayor, how do we make sure we capture questions like that so that they get a response? Because I'm not sure we're going to have a chance to respond. Um, uh, I would ask that you write them down. And then during the last part of the meeting, the idea is, is to, if you want to go ahead and ask someone to come back up and you know, ask you know, a question of them or try and answer that question specifically. Maybe this is a good place for me <clears throat> to remind everyone that you're always welcome to send an email to the city council so you can send, a, send an email to us individually or to a group. So if you have a comment or question that doesn't surface tonight and you want us to hear that, feel free to send an email. Um, I just worry about expectation of questions that we might not be able to answer in the course of our dialogue tonight. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, and then uh, Gaylord, Victor, Victoria, Victoria, you're next after Mary. Okay, Mary. My name is Mary Richards. I live at 720 Kellogg here in Ames. And I think that uh, you probably all know what the topic of my uh, presentation is going to be. I do not have any specific recommendations for or against expansion in any of the four regions that the city has put forward. I am primarily concerned about environmental concerns, which are, I would say, addressed in the plan, uh, insofar as they talk about the number of, of vehicle miles to be expected uh, per 
person, buffer zones, the, the integrity of our water sources, and so forth. Those are fine. Those are great. But I'm telling you, those are 20th century issues. We are now two decades into the 21st century. And I think that it behooves all of us, including the city council, to recognize how important it is that we take into account the effects of the climate crisis. Um, the city should set specific timelines uh, to bring community carbon footprints to zero. And this includes whatever expansion choices you decide. We really should be doing that. Many other cities of our size and with our composition have done that already. I think the city of Ames should do it as well. We should be looking at a citywide recycle system that would include all of the areas that you plan to expand into. We should be looking to whatever we can do to convert our transportation into non-fossil fuel uh, kinds of approaches. We should, you should, in terms of uh, the expansion or the allowed expansion, you should be considering what kind of materials are you going to allow contractors to use. Cement is one of the highest carbon footprint things there is. And there are lots of other alternatives. There, there, are, there are many things that are happening nowadays that I think the city should become aware of and should really, you know, let's, let's be proactive in this area. We are blessed in this community with so many experts in relevant fields, thanks to ISU and many of the people who are there. We ought to be taking their expertise into account. We ought to be using the resources that we have. So uh, I just ask you to make the climate crisis a central background thing that you're thinking of as you consider where we're going to expand. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Okay, Kent, is it Vic, Vicar, Vic, Vickery, next. Hi, my name is Gaylord Victoria, a new resident to Ames. My wife and I moved here in September, and uh, one of the main reasons why we moved here is because of the many diverse cultural and uh, social activities. So uh, I commend you for having that um, uh, opportunity, those opportunities, and I think it's marvelous that we actually have uh, opportunity to go even farther. I do have some concerns, and um, number one is funding for all these ambitious projects. And I'm concerned about, do we have specific answers to where current financial assets would come from and projected revenue streams and sources? I guess I'm concerned because I've been involved heavily with um, uh, taxpayers association meetings in uh, previous capacities. So I'm concerned about fees, taxes, and permits, which on the surface looks like it would be logical to use when considering expanded services, but they can be a detriment to bringing in new individuals. And I also would like to make sure that we have an authentic, thorough, robust and res respective discussion of citizen input. Um, one of the things that really concerned me, and I shared this with Kelly actually today, is that when we first got here, we heard about the Healthy Life Center. And on the surface, that looks good to bring in something like that. I'm in the healthcare field myself and I'm totally behind those kinds of activities. However, when you ask the taxpayers to shoulder that burden, and when we find out that other substantial donors to those efforts are ones that are, uh, shall we say, conditional, so that if it doesn't suit their needs, they can pull out, and yet the taxpayers are still gonna be on the hook for that kind of program. So that does concern me. So um, those are some of the issues I have. Lastly, I will tell you that I see that uh, for the north uh, area that we're looking at, it's indicated that a public safety resource or a facility, including police, is being considered. Uh, that's great, but I think we need more than just police. I'd like to suggest also <coughs> that we look at um, fire, and maybe it was fire, but public safety, police, and EMT services, 
and also consider what the impact of water and sewer expansion would be there. So uh, those are some of my concerns. And again, I'm glad to be here in Ames and um, I'm gonna be more involved in the activities here as well. So thank you. Very good, thank you. Thanks for coming. All right, Kent and then Phil. Isaroli, be next. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, I kind of wanted to follow up uh, when I looked through my emails about a year ago last day. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Would you, I'm sorry. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, you're, would you introduce yourself? Yes. And, and your address. Kemp Vicra, 2625 Meadow Glen Road. Thank Ames, you. Iowa. And um, been in, back in Ames for 20 years. Part of that graduate of Iowa State Ag Business and that. So familiar with Ames and great community. Um, with looking over to tonight's meeting, I pulled up the email I sent to everybody last April, really regarding um, the Southwest area out there. And um, a lot of my concerns are really the same of safety, environmental, excuse me, issues of the creek, limited growth really of the Iowa State farms out there. And, um, but what I want to say is, you know, participating in over a year in this 2040 plan, You've really done a lot of work. So I want to commend the council on that, taking into a lot of things I haven't thought of. So I've learned a lot. And um, so I really want to compliment you on that. What I did want to follow up on is still the concerns of me being out there in the last year. You know, we have the new poultry farm, the hog farm is building, the feed mills there, really the ag sector and that has just boomed. Um, I went back through the Iowa State land use policy of 1996 and that discusses that ag buffer there too. So my comment was really um, as agriculture has grown and my neighbors, I mean, there's ag issues of odor when they spread the manure and that, that I really want the council to be aware of and consider when they look at planning out to the um, Southwest, because even people who live there bring up the odor and things. I'm not sure if everybody, you know, they see the area, but they aren't really aware of what's past just a quarter of a mile. And really where the livestock is, is just a few feet away. So bringing more people to that area, I think kind of puts a conflict between agriculture and what people expect out there. So those are my comments, but again, thank you. Thank you, Ken. Yeah. And Paul Livingston, you know, you're up after uh, Phil. Uh, I'm Phil A. Sevely, uh, 3108 South Dakota Avenue. And uh, I've been before the council here several times over the years. Um, the, I would like to uh, discuss the uh, impact of development on um, the rural and agricultural activities. The um, decisions that affect the growth and development have uh, long-term impacts on many conditions and resources in the planned development areas. And it really doesn't matter where it is, it, it's all the same. Um, growth brings a need for uh, a carefully balanced, um, the needs of the residents and the businesses within the areas involved without sacrificing the area's assets and the quality of life. And I think we all agree with that. Uh, positive assets and quality of life are often associated with growth's long-term impact on the preservation of natural resources, public health, transportation resources, and adequate provision for emergency services. So we need to think about that. I mean, I know there's been discussion about an additional fire station, so on and so forth. Um, but I would like to, re to focus right now on the natural resources and environmental quality that, is, that gets impact in the area. Um, decisions affecting the growth and development have long-term impacts on the condition of such environmental factors as the soils, groundwater, rivers, and major drainage ways, steep slopes, scattered woodlands, natural prairies, and wetland areas. So they're all impacted. And in the Southwest area, in the area that I live in, in the Whirly Creek Basin, all those things come into play. Um, these natural areas provide habitat for wildlife and are necessary to, to sustain and support environmental systems. In other words, the ecosystems and all the lives, live, uh, all the animals and so forth that live there uh, and plants. These resources also minimize the negative effects of stormwater runoff stabilize soils, 
modify climate effects, provide visual attractiveness, which is sometimes a detriment, and serve as recreational areas. So development encroaching systems, system corridors, such as woodland areas, natural vegetation areas, and the like reduces the quality and the extent of these areas for the wildlife habitat and other en environmental be benefits they provide. Impacts can be direct as in removing or altering the habitat itself or indirect such as increased human activity, decreasing vegetation species diversity or increasing predator animal species. In other words, some of the raptors and so forth that we have presently, we have eagles out there. We have very various species of um, owls and so forth that depend on the small mammals that are in that area, as well as the fish in the creek. Anyway, um, identifying such resources and cooperatively planning in order to sustain the natural areas within the planning area helps mitigate the negative effects of the growth and development on these areas. Um, I would encourage the council, if they haven't already, but I'll pull this up. This is the 2005 study, Worley Creek Sanitary Sewer Extension study that was done. The city funded $60,000, $65,000 to have Stanley consultants do this. It's quite comprehensive. It talks about the slope of the land, talks about the different animals, the flora and fauna, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I would like you to review that if possible. I would like to express my concern to city council and city staff that they would review the Worley Creek Sanitary Sewer Extension Study completed by Stanley and consultants and presented <laughs> to the city of Ames in January 2005. This comprehensive study should be used as an additional tool in any future considerations involving development of the area indicated in the Southwest growth area in the Ames 2040 plan. Thank you. So, thank you. Hector Arbuckle will follow after uh, Paul. Paul Livingston, 105 South 16th Street, Ames. I'm representing the Champlin Lloyd property that uh, is, this, is this a pointer? Yeah. At any rate, it's in the it's in the southwest corner. It's not identified as a tier one, two, three, four property. However, it should be identified as a tier one property. This is a property that's ready to go. It has 15 inch uh, sewer, eight inch water. In fact, it's on the city council agenda next uh, Tuesday as a voluntary annexation. Looking through the 2040 plan as already outlined in the scenario development concepts and guiding principles, this property checks off a number of the <clears throat> items of importance, whether it be buffering, floodplain protection, open space, recreational areas, roadways, connectivity. It's already uh, adjacent to the city, corporate city limits of Ames. Uh, one half of the 170 acres is in the Ames School District. I, I would hope that this property could be considered an, into your conversation for a number of reasons. Again, they have uh, the proximity to Iowa State, research park, fire services, whether it's where it currently is on Welch or whether it's relocated, centrally located. It would serve as a tie-in between um, uh, state and um, South Dakota. If you're not aware of where the property is located, it straddles uh, Dartmoor on both the north and south, and uh, much of the property abuts uh, Zumwalt Station Road to the south. It's a it's a natural growth area, and with any concerns regarding environmental protection, I think that can be addressed. It's a beautiful piece of land, timber to the north side. Certainly, Whirly Creek is a part of that. But this property is ready to go right now. I believe it's a tier one property and it merits your consideration. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Kim Christensen will follow after uh, Hector. Hello. Um, my name is Hector Arbuckle. Um, I'm at 519 Oliver Circle. Um, I've lived in Ames since I was seven, and I'm currently an Iowa State student. So um, I'm kind of disappointed in this 20-year uh, plan because um, according to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, we only have 10 years to substantially reduce um, our carbon emissions. Um, and especially as a developed country, we should be reducing our emissions to zero or negative as soon as possible. So looking at this 20-year uh, plan, all these new uh, scenario concepts are basically kind of same old, same old. They're not looking, we're not assuming or even planning for the wide scale transformation that we're going to need in the way we live and the way we design our communities. So um, looking here, especially in the north, but also in basically all the other ones, we've got assumptions that we're going to be having, um, even though it's claimed to be complete streets, it's still going to be like, um, have a lot of roads and a lot of single family houses and the the infrastructure may not even be sustainable so i believe that our that the city of ames should uh, take the responsibility for future generations of making sure that all new development in ames is carbon neutral from the beginning so that we do not have to go over and retrofit it um, when we have to eventually transition to renewable energy. Um, we should make sure that our homes are made out of sustainable materials, um, that they are uh, built in a way that does not use much energy, and that the city itself is designed to promote uh, walkability and the use of public transportation so that we all can um, live in a community that is carbon neutral and that makes it work for all citizens rather than us having to you know, individually try and work against the system to be carbon neutral. So um, with that, I leave you just please incorporate climate change into this plan. Thank you. Uh, Lynn Lloyd will follow after Kim. I'm uh, Kim Christensen, 2985 South Dakota Avenue. Um, as, uh, as you are aware, Iowa State controls about 3,500 acres directly south of Highway 30 between University Boulevard to the east and County Line Road to the west. This property is intensely agricultural. There are a few private acres between the ISU properties and the Highway 30 that are not all as rural acre, uh, acreages. The city needs uh, that area as a buffer. This is my thought, I mean, that the city needs this area as a buffer between the heavy egg use of the dairy and swine feedlots and the intense urban development. I ask that the remaining developable acres in this area be left in the county so they could be developed as rural subdivisions with large lots and utility, county utilities making the area more compatible to the rural lifestyle that already exists. This would create the continuity of preserving this environmentally sensitive area and serve to provide large lots for those who want them. But most of all, it would create a wonderful buffer between the existing intense rural usage and the city urban uses of land. The, uh, I thank you for the opportunity to express my thoughts and for your consideration. Thank you, Kim. Peter Hollick after uh, Lynn. Yes, hello. Uh, I'm Lynn Champlin Lloyd. I live at 3818 Phoenix Street, Ames, Iowa. I have a huge history prior to my coming to Ames. My grandfather came here at the turn of the century. He helped develop Campus Town, built a lot of buildings in Campus Town, so that has been my legacy. He also bought a farm on Dartmoor Road and State Street. That farm was 170 acres that he raised Pertrin horses, Hackney horses, and Tamworth hogs. It was a very 
wonderful thing for him to do. He loved horses and he raised them. Over the years, he died in 1936. My grandmother inherited the farm. She lived there until 1984. She died at 80 in 1984 at 100 years old. I have been in Ames since approximately that time too. And the Ames farm has been part of my heart. I lived on State Street across from the farm because I didn't figure out how I could build a house on it yet. But it was my dream. So in the 1980s, we, I was living across from the farm and we were thinking about maybe building and, and dreaming the dreams. But we decided maybe, my brother and I, maybe we'll develop the farm into one to two acre lots, which we tried. And we spent two and a half years working on developing an estate out there with one to two acre lots, a horse facility with riding trails. Well, that was a good idea until after two and a half years of developing it, we brought it in front of the city council and they said, oh wait, it's within the two mile limit of the city of Ames. And to do that, you cannot have wells and septic systems. And of course, at that time, it was outside the city where we had no water or septic or, or in, in, the, in the city of Ames. And so that was table. That was Jeff Benson that spearheaded that, if you remember Jeff. Time passed. 30 years have passed. My brother is 75. I'm 73. And we're kind of getting ready that we need to sell the farm. And so in that process, we have been working with the city of Ames planning and zoning. And we're looking for what can be done out there. Because the city, it is in their future planning. Prior to that, we helped the city put in city water and sewer, which we paid for part of, down the Dartmoor Road and through the valley to, to, uh, uh, to give water and sewer to the people out there. That was $80,000, which we spent. To do that, we had to sell off 10 acres of that farm. So now, many years later, <laughs> We're ready to move on, and we, next Tuesday, we will be out here again to talk about annexing a portion of that farm because it's ready. As Paul Livingston stated, it is ready. We have city water right down Dartmoor Road. We have city sewer that goes through the valley. I am very, very aware of the environmental issues out there. Someone will have to deal with that whoever would be buying it and developing it. But we have figured out there is a huge valley there that cannot be developed. It'll be beautiful, the Whirly Creek. It'll have to stay the Whirly Creek with all of its beauty. And it'll be a wonderful place for people in Ames to live. And so we're hoping as of Tuesday that we can get this part that we have talked about annexed into the city of Ames after a 40 year process here. So really seriously look at it. It's, it's going to be a wonderful place for people to live. And it's within the two mile limit of city of Ames and the, the university, very, very close. So seriously look at it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Brent Pringit, Pringnitz will follow after uh, Peter. Hello, my name's Peter Halleck. I live at uh, 114 8th Street in the Old Town area. Um, basically, I appreciate what's, um, uh, the way this is being considered where we're sort of looking in one sense, we're looking at four straw men. Uh, if you understand that the intent is not to put 15,000 people in one of these areas, but it's to look at what would happen if 15 people came into these areas. Uh, but the intent is to figure out how to accommodate a growth of about 15,000 in the city of Ames. Uh, at this point, we haven't yet looked at infill and what the capacity to absorb population is of the existing city area. And I'm 
certainly hoping that infill can do a good portion of the 15,000. Mm -hmm. I really am not in favor of fringe development uh, on any of the directions, uh, but I'd also like to specifically uh, express concerns about the east and the south developments because while we've looked at, or while you've and the consultant have looked at streets, sewers, water costs to improve those areas, you haven't looked at transit. And I know the east uh, development area is almost a dead area for transit. Uh, right now, that area is served by demand response because it is just impossible to develop a fixed route that can efficiently serve that area because you've got about two miles of floodplain that's undeveloped that just means a, a totally uneconomical service to get out there. Right now, it is served by demand responsive service, but you put a big uh, number of people out there demand response isn't really going to work anymore. Uh, so I would urge you to put as much of the growth as you can into the existing city limits as infill, and I would urge you to look at contiguous development rather than uh, development that jumps over a uh, floodplain to... Uh, <clears throat> I'd also strongly urge that whatever is analyzed in the final uh, looks very much at what the cost for transit service to those areas are. Uh, streets, sewer, uh, water are a one-time, relatively one-time. They have a life. I realize they have to be renewed after a certain period. But transit is an ongoing cost. And so getting into an area that's inefficient to be served by transit uh, is just a mistake. And I totally agree with the idea of trying to make this a carbon neutral uh, growth, but I hope that as much as possible, we can absorb it within the existing city limits. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Irv, if you'd come up after Brant is done, you can remain seated if you like to and come up when we're done. We'll have Irv come after he's done. He doesn't, he doesn't have to, he, he can say, remain seated if he wants to. I know it's a little hard for him. Brent Pregnitz, 2377, 240th Street in Ames. Uh, but that puts me just over the county line into Boone County. Um, maybe a little late to the party, and it seems on the Boone County side, we've not heard a whole lot about this. And so you can imagine it was just a bit unnerving to follow a Facebook link, link, click on a map, and see your farm carved up into high density and low density and streets. Um, so that's a, a bit, bit taken all at once. Um, so you can imagine my concerns with the southwest area. I come at it from two standpoints, from an agricultural standpoint, as I do farm in that area. And I'm also a university employee and have a background in ag research. So I've worked with a lot of the farms in that area and familiar with them. I did go back and take a look at the uh, Ames Fringe Plan from, I believe, those 2007, uh, which involved all the communities and counties. Uh, a guiding principle for cooperative planning, and I'm reading from this principle too, Boone County, Story County, City of Ames, and City of Gilbert seek to work together to preserve agricultural lands and protect rural lands. And I saw a lot of those statements throughout the fringe plan talking about preservation of rural lifestyle and agriculture. Also references to the importance of respecting the university's presence in agricultural research in south and western areas of town. Looking through the documents online for the current proposed plans, I'm struck by how little, if any, mention of agriculture I see in that document. Um, I understand Ames' limitations. There's only so much space. 
Also understand agricultural limitations. We're being forced to do more with less all the time. And as my grandfather constantly reminded me, they don't make any more of it. There's no more land out there to farm. Looking at the encroachment on universities' properties and agricultural research, uh, those are long-term investments out there. Research is a long-time investment. It takes a long time to establish some of those projects out there. Standing in my yard, I can look to the east and see University Farm within a mile. Southeast, a half mile. Straight south across the road, half mile. I look to the west, one mile. Beyond that, I see the agronomy farm, which was moved out there a long time ago from the floodplain to get away from Ames Grove. And you're headed that direction again. Um, so I thank you for the opportunity to present comments, um, but I do have concerns with the direction and uh, continued growth to the Southwest. Thank you. Thank you. Jerry, Neil, and we'll follow after Irv. Thank you. I'm Irv Kloss. I live at 2200 Hamilton Drive in her names. And I speak to you tonight uh, from the perspective of my long-term education and research as a population biologist. I've studied the four growth areas that, that you've outlined, and I have concerns about all of them, but mostly about the one to the north. Um, it seems that the north growth area will be the largest as far as uh, population density and geographical area yet there's less infrastructure shown to accommodate transportation, particularly uh, to access I-35. Um, Riverside Drive is indicated as the primary arterial to the east and will require a new interchange that will depend upon D DOT planning and funding, I assume. But Grand Avenue will be the only route to downtown Ames and Grand, North Grand Mall area. Until recently, I lived on Grand Avenue for 43 years. And traffic on Grand Avenue has increased significantly during that time. Until recently, I lived, oh, years ago, I jokingly called the Ames Audubon, Audubon because speed limits are not enforced and drivers often exceed 50 miles an hour. And this is a residential area that's where I lived. Now I'm having trouble to sell in my house on Grand because buyers don't want to live there because of the heavy traffic. When Grand Avenue is extended to the south, as you're planning, you might as well widen it to six lanes and call it a freeway. The south growth area seems to have the least amount of geographical area, and yet a planned connection to the interstate is directly, directly to it. You recall that I spoke to the council about a year ago and stated that this 20-year comprehensive plan was business as usual, and I still think that. The International Panel on Climate change had just issued a warning just two months before I spoke to you that nations would have a little more than a decade, 12 years to 2030 to reverse the trend of global warming or it might be too late to control it. Global warming is a crisis. Is this land use plan a crisis? Are people lined up on the highways coming into Ames, aching to get in. Now I'm going to become uh, my usual radical self. Uh, the biggest concern I have with this plan is the word growth. Growth to a developer means money. To an environmentalist and a population biologist like me, and someone concerned about future generations. Growth means more finite resources will have to be used up. 
the fact that the Earth's atmosphere cannot safely absorb the amount of carbon we are pumping into it is simply a symptom to a much larger crisis. The crisis I refer to is the central fiction on which your economic model is based. It is the myth that our planet is limitless, that we will always be able to find more of what we need. It is not just the atmosphere that we have exploited beyond its capacity to recover. We are doing the same to the oceans, to fresh water, to topsoil, and to biodiversity. The expansionist extractive mindset that has long governed our relationship to nature in this country, to what this growth scenario calls into question so fundamentally. Are you certain that our drinking water aquifer will support another 15,000 people and all the industrial and commercial development that will come along with those people? The soil out there that you plan to cover over with houses is the richest in the world. It should be used to grow food for people because it will soon be impractical and too expensive to ship food hundreds and even thousands of miles as we do now. The abundance of scientific research that shows we have pushed nature beyond its limits demands not just green products and market-based solution, solutions. We need a new paradigm, a new paradigm for civilization, one grounded not in dominance over nature, but in respect for natural cycles of renewal and acutely sensitive to natural limits, including the limits of human intelligence. So I'm sending you a message. Many of Western culture's most cherished ideas no longer apply. For the sake of future generations, look for a new paradigm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, please. I respectfully ask the audience to refrain from clapping or um, modes of support, please. All right, Jerry. And after Jerry, we'll have uh, Jody Chittick. I'm Jerry Neal, 916 Ridgewood Avenue here in Ames, Iowa. Thank you to Irv and to others who have made some very relevant comments about the challenges facing us as climate change does manifest. Appreciate that. I'm here tonight to share some comments from the Ames Bicycle Coalition. And we do appreciate the opportunity to comment on the vision planning. Clearly, 2040 is about a vision for the future of Ames. It's an opportunity to plan for what we would like our community to become. For Ames Bicycle Coalition, this includes uh, becoming a community for transportation equity, for cyclists, for pedestrians and transit, is paramount. It's not just about supporting automobile and alternate transportation, and that was definitely one of the guidelines that council gave to RDG, but it's about prioritizing transportation equity. So with respect to any kind of future planning, this means encouraging infill and prioritizing the ease of getting around in Ames by something other than a motorized personal vehicle. And we've already seen over the past few years significant increases in alternate transportation in the form of walking, bicycling, electric skateboards, scooters. These are trends that can be expected to continue if they're accommodated for from the outset. So with respect to evaluating the 2040 scenarios, the Ames Bike Coalition's number one priority is whether or not the scenarios actively encourage <clears throat> alternate transportation from the outset. And if so, how do those scenarios compare to each other? The kind of uh, community future that we want 
to support. It starts with transportation equity. For example, if one of the scenarios disinclines cyclist or pedestrian access at the outset, that is, there's no accommodation in tier one or tier one interim, that's gonna raise a red flag for us. If a scenario suggests that it's difficult or costly or delayed for SciRide service, that's going to raise a red flag for us. Um, an example might be our concern for uh, growth to the east. We call it northeast, but to the east development. The question is, will any improved alternate access be done in Tier 1? If not, it seems that a number of people might live and work there for many years before there is a new intersection at I-35 and 13th Street. It might mean that a family could live there 20 years. You could have your children, get them through school, and send them to college, and they never have that safe connection to downtown via a bicycle. And it doesn't seem like a vision that we want for Ames. So we are unclear, the Bike Coalition, about some of the behind-the-scenes um, modeling for these scenarios with respect to transportation, or what we call alternate transportation. To what extent and how are the alternate transportations included in the models? And our concern isn't that they're not included. It is how, how are they assigned weight? Are they assigned a fair weight um, to alternate transportation priorities versus just a kind of for the day waiting? Um, because it seems as though the scenarios that are laid out designed first for the automotive and then that leaves us to apply our complete streets concepts at a little bit later date as best that we can. But that's an approach that's relying on retrofitting, not on planning. So a vehicle heavy approach also seems to encourage being able to push the design and the implementation of alternate transportation modes back further into the scenarios. And this is sometimes justified by talking about how many miles this might be from downtown. However, it's not distance per se that discourages people from biking and walking. It's the conditions that you have to bike or walk under. Conditions, proximity to high volume, high speed traffic, unsafe or poorly designed intersections, lack of biking and walking facilities, streetscapes that are empty of people and places. That's what will keep people from riding and walking much more than distance. So the Bike Coalition wants to urge you to question what barriers to walking and to cycling and to transit may be implicated in some of these scenarios that we're looking at. We want you to keep the vision of AIMS that encourages and promotes alt.transportation as you make your decisions. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Jody Chittick. I live at 3830 Hyde Highway. <laughs> and I say that because I've lived there for 14 years. My oldest son was three years old and my youngest was one. And it was pretty busy back then. But eventually, oh, by the way, I'm here to represent the people of Hyde Highway, or Hyde, <laughs> I'm sorry, Hyde Avenue, and um, the Bloomington, Bloomington Heights neighborhood um, on the traffic calming project on Hyde. I'm very concerned about this, and I want to be involved, because I've lived there, like I said, 14 years, and it's not been easy. So when the road Hyde Avenue was extended up to Gilbert and paved, once it was open, it changed. The traffic doubled, the speeding increased, and I worry about the kids. I have lived here for 30 years. I'm a two-time graduate of Iowa State University, as well as my husband who works in the research park. And we did move out of town for a while. When we moved back, we knew we wanted to raise our kids in Ames. At the time, I didn't even know we were in the Gilbert School District. <laughs> but when my son started kindergarten, I started be, to be a substitute teacher, and I've been doing that nine years. 
because I could be with my kids and I could be home with them. So I'm a mom, I'm a homemaker. I'm here to represent the people and the kids and the traffic problem. I love Ames and I love where I live, but I don't like the traffic and I don't like the speeding. And I've had some incidents where I've almost been hit getting my mail. It's 25 miles per hour and people don't do the speed limit. I don't know how to stop it besides taking a license plate down and calling the police. So I wanna go through with you just a couple of things that I think could help and basically wanna see my, say my piece. I just got back into town last night and heard about this meeting and I'm so glad I did. So I do wanna suggest any way that you can inform us better if we don't follow City of Ames, I'd greatly appreciate it. And I don't know how we can do that without social media, but I think it's really important. Um, so one of the first things I wanna recommend to you is more stop signs. If we can put a stop sign at the, so Banshell, or I'm sorry, not Banshell, Banford Park, I believe it's called, the park at Hyde and Bloomington, we need a stop sign at Welbeck and Hyde. And I know this, I've heard it slows the flow of traffic, but I disagree with that. I believe it slows it down. There is a park there, there is a huge crosswalk, and there are many, many young kids that cross that walk. My kids, of course, in the past have. Now my kids are, are in high school, so they don't go to the park. But you can expect on a summer afternoon or a Saturday, 50 plus people at that <coughs> park, not just from our neighborhood, but from other people. And it's great because it's a nice wide open space. And I love it. Um, but that angle where it comes out is just like a problem. People have almost been hit there. Kids have almost been hit. I would like to recommend some kind of flashing light at least and the, um, the walkway that goes across the street to be redone that would help just signal people because since this road first opened all the way up to Gilbert, so many new people I think are taking that road and I don't blame them, it's faster, but I think they need to be warned that there's kids crossing here. Um, I do think as you further go north on Hyde, I believe the next block is Harrison. There should be stop sign there. Let's slow people down. <clears throat> Maybe put a speed bump. It's supposed to be 25. People aren't doing 25. And every time I come home, I'm doing 20 because I'm so worried and I want to slow people down. And I will go around the block two times to get them to slow down. That's just me. I'm a mom. I want to protect the kids. I can't help it. So I believe that some stop signs would help within the neighborhood. Um, like I said, going back to the park, the flashing light, doing the crosswalk again, we only have parking on the west side of the road. And a lot of people don't know when you go to that park that you can only park at that so on that one side. Jody, I'm going to interrupt you. Um, I appreciate your concern. I think we've heard about the concern on Hyde. Can you, can you focus on your comments on the Ames 2040 plan and how this might help or your concerns about that? Because that, this is a topic that we certainly are concerned about. You can mm -hmm. come back and talk about it more as well. So I think it's been, it's been duly noted. We got, we got notes on I that. didn't really see a specific plan yet because, like I said, I just got into town. Yep. I haven't seen a plan for what you're planning to do for the okay. calming project on Hyde. Yeah, well, actually. So I would like to see that plan first, specifically yep. what your plan is. Yeah, and that really is not part and parcel of the Ames 2040 plan. Oh, so I apologize. Well, a, I, saw it, I saw it listed that's in all right. there. That's all right. So I mean, that's I think why that, I'm here. It's I think it's certainly relevant. I mean, we're very concerned yeah, about absolutely. traffic sure. on, on Hyde. So, Mr. Mayor, I think what she's referring to is in the North Growth area, it lists traffic improvements, and it has a, uh, a specific mm. bullet that says Hyde Avenue traffic. Call. Gotcha. Yeah. Just yeah. like we say lane widening for other places. Yeah. So I'm okay. assuming that's what you're yes. referring to. Okay. Yes. Yes. So that's so, that so, northern growth scenario. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think the, the, the traffic generated from the North Growth was clearly shown to, to over, be over capacity on Hyde in the future. Okay. Thank you, Kelly. Um, so who who can Jody talk to further about the traffic calming project? Is that something that Damien's working on? There isn't right a now? real traffic calming project because it was okay. what, it, it depends on where we go with growth, what the follow-up implementation measures are. So okay. it was highlighted just like a lot of things that if you do this, you're gonna have to come up with an implementation measure to be able to address it. So okay. right now there is not such a project. It's not in the CIP. It would be something that okay. would come out yep. after we if, if the city goes that way, you'd have to have implementation measures. Okay. okay. I, Can I just make two more comments absolutely, on, since absolutely. I've Thank started you. Thank you. on this? Because I yep. live there and yep. 
Um, so I've already talked to you about the couple of things there. And it, this is kind of what maybe hits this on the next point. When you go up the road and you hit 190th, you can't get across. So I know you've talked to something about up there expanding. Because if you leave in the morning at 730 and you're going north on Hyde, if you want to turn left or go straight across 190th, you will sit there for a while. I actually tell my kids to go around and take 69 because there's less traffic. And so I know we're on the border of City of Ames and Gilbert. That's not my point. My point is I'm concerned about the Hyde Avenue and the traffic. And But with that, we have the traffic because of the growth. Mm -hmm. There's new housing developments up there. There's a lot of new people in the area and they don't respect the speed limit. And it is a very curvy road. So I think more speed limit signs, more stop signs, um, whatever we can do to protect families and kids, mm -hmm. honestly. My last thing I want to say about this on the Hyde Avenue traffic calming project is I've heard rumors that our parking might be mm -hmm. taken away. Now, before I moved to this house, um, there was no parking in the beginning on Hyde Avenue. And then some people who live there fought for it and said, we need parking on one side. And here's why. The homes on Hyde are only two garage door, like two cars can go in. So if you take our parking away, where are my two kids going to park? So I really, I just want to say, please, and you look forward to, to this project, I would love to give my input. Don't take our parking away because I fear that you take our parking away. It's going to make it even more of a traffic problem. And so I'm looking at my husband saying, what do we do? Do we need to put in an extra cement pad and spend five, $8,000? I don't want to do that. Um, and my kids, my son's going to go to Iowa State this fall and he's going to live in the dorms, but he's going to move home. And there's always going to be an extra car there. Um, so I guess, yeah, that between Bloomington Road and 190th, it is a problem. I really hope that in your future, you're coming up with these decisions and everything else in your future plan that you really look towards, look at this because it's like, you know, living on Grand Avenue. When that man said that, I felt, oh, I felt for him, you know, and I worry that that road is going to become that. So thank you for letting thank me share everything. I apologize you. that it wasn't directly towards, no, towards think, this, but I thank you Kelly, for bringing that up. I think Kelly, Kelly helped uh, clarify that. So thank you. Okay. You're Jermaine. Thank Great. You. Thank Mayor, you. Mayor, could I make a point to Jody's? Yes. Um, Jody, you mentioned about the, the importance of uh, staying up to date with what we're doing. And I think people should know that there's a really easy way of doing that. So if you go on the Ames Plan 2040 page, there's a link to sign up for updates. So as we progress through this process, if you want those updates, that's a very easy way uh, to stay up on top, on, top, on top of what we're doing. So the Ames 2040 uh, page of the city's website. And Thanks. you can get to that from the home page of the city. Right. So thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Okay, I have another card, and I'm, I'm going to apologize ahead of time. I'm going to spell it. It's D-H-R-V-V Raturi. My apologies, and if you would uh, help correct me and help me understand how to pronounce your name, I'd appreciate it. It's very close to Drew. Hello, everyone. My name is Thruv Raturi. Uh, my address is 2026 Hawthorne Court, and I go to Iowa State University. I'm here to talk on behalf of the new residents that are the premise of today's discussion, this new growth that we are talking about. When I came to Ames from New Delhi, I was surprised that you could breathe the air here and that the water aquifer wasn't <coughs> leached with chromium or arsenic, which is actually a huge problem back home. This is the environmental degradation that some of your new residents are fleeing. Therefore, this growth cannot be business as usual. You cannot attract new residents that are, that are fleeing broken water, air, and transportation systems by proposing streets that are not walkable. A waste stream that is medieval even when compared to standards back home. Walkability in particular is a great opportunity that I urge everyone to consider. It reduces the extent of change in land use, in land use required <coughs> that would allow farmers to keep their plots of 
farmland, walkability, and as previously mentioned, equitable transportation, also is good for local communities, local commercial enterprises, as new residents, people that look, act, and interact with people like me, are more easily incorporated into the communities and um, are more, and learn the importance of, of shopping local. We have an opportunity to reimagine the city and to create a sustainable and inclusive future. So I ask, should our new development be number one, net zero emissions, Number two, make room for community gardens. Number three, ban the use of natural gas and fossil fuels for space heating in favor of beneficial electrification so that when we retire our carbon intensive power plant, which we all know serves the, serves the use, serves the main purpose of it being to convert waste into ashes over Ames, um, that we know that when that happens, that heating can become more sustainable. Thank you for hearing the perspective that potential future residents such as myself might have, these 15,000 or so people um, that are fleeing areas that have experienced extreme environmental degradation um, and are attracted to areas such as Ames because of its pristine natural beauty and efforts by residents such as y'all to, to maintain that environment of, um, you know, just amazing nature. Thank you. All right, Linda Rickon. Good evening. Uh, Linda Merkin, 17185 GW Carver Avenue, Gilbert. Uh, thank you for holding this session. I am a lifelong Story County resident, spent about the first 20 years of my life in Franklin Township then moved to Ames, and then moved back to Franklin Township, where I currently live. And when I moved back, I said, where did Franklin Township go? I really appreciate the um, people who have come before here and talked about agricultural land. I've seen prime agricultural land gobbled up to development all my life. I think I'm sitting here thinking Taylor Farm, Youthy Farm, Madsen Farm, other farms that were very productive farms now are housing developments. I know Ames is going to grow. Ames has grown all my life into other parts of Story County. But when I look at that map, I see lots more agricultural land. And as one speaker said, we're not making any more of it. And when I, I did see, I was at the uh, presentation where we talked about infill. I was disappointed there didn't seem to be more infill opportunities. I also agree with people who are talking about climate change and who are talking about transportation. And as all the population, single family homes sprawls out into this agricultural land, what are the transportation costs? What are the carbon fuel costs? I know Ames is going to continue to grow. I would encourage you to do as much as you can to infill, even if you need to do, be looking at some things and finding ways to encourage some things that are less than the traditional housing or different than the traditional housing that people seem to want because we're getting it at a very huge cost and we need to think about that. Um, I also would like to talk just briefly about the urban fringe plan. Whatever happens, you know, whatever um, growth scenarios you, you're looking at here, I think the urban fringe plan needs to change and needs to be strengthened. It's about ready to expire. Hopefully we will continue it until uh, we're ready to <coughs> renegotiate that in this county. But I think there's going to be more, more players in that, more actors, more, more interests that need to be looked at. And I hope it can be strengthened to the point that it's not simply an administrative document in terms of how things get done, but it really talks about what gets done, and that's a cooperative venture among the Ames and its surrounding communities in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's all the cards that I have. Are there anyone else that wants to address council this evening? <clears throat>
Evening, Mayor, Council, Justin Dodge, Hunziker Companies, 105 South 16th Street. I want to take just a couple minutes and thank staff and our consultants, RDG. They spent a lot of time, had a lot of input sessions. Uh, certainly appreciate all the outreach that has taken place. So just had a couple of observations that I want to share with everybody. Um, I truly believe that this has been a, a really thoughtful approach, uh, balancing our future needs as well as uh, the parameters of the community. At first, when the Ames 2040 plan was coming out, I thought for sure it was only gonna be one direction, that's it. And so when the consultants and staff came back with the tiered approach and now the different scenarios where we're looking at different tiers and different directions, I'm really um, happy and, and pleased with the options and the flexibility that we have before us. So um, when we look at the costs, because obviously that's one of the lenses that we're looking at things, uh, I think it's important to remind everybody that those costs include a lot of developer um, investments that are then turned over to the city. And a lot of the other costs that are in there could be pioneer infrastructure that are repaid by connection districts or um, assessments on the land, things like that. So the taxpayer is not on the hook for a lot of the costs that are shown in these estimates. I think that's important for everybody to understand. So, um, and then in looking at the estimates and, and things like that, and, and even staff had commented that these were very conservative, conservative estimates I think we need to keep that in the back of our mind. So uh, appreciate the options, appreciate the flexibility, and I believe the development community would be able to adapt and respond with whatever scenario or, or options uh, you select. So thank you. Thank you. Chuck? Chuck Winkleblack, <clears throat> excuse me, Hunziker Companies, 105 South 16th Street. Just a couple of of quick points. I was a part of this 20 years ago or more when we went through this the first time. And this is a much different scenario and process than, than it was back then and appreciate all the time that's been uh, put at it and, and the manner in which it's prepared and, and displayed. One thing in thinking about, I don't remember the lady's name that talked about Gilbert and Hyde Avenue. I think when Kelly made his presentation Last time we talked about, I think the challenge for you folks will be not just picking the low hanging fruit and, and making some of the tough decisions <clears throat> because some of the reasons I believe is why Hyde Avenue is the way it is, is we picked out some artificial lines and said, Ames is never, 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 never gonna grow beyond this point. And we built that infrastructure as such. And so I think your job, your challenge will be, and I don't envy the position uh, that you folks are in and having to go through that is uh, to be mindful of not only the costs, the environment, all of those things, but also to make sure that when we're looking at some of these pioneer infrastructure things, that we also know that this plan goes beyond the next 10 years or 20 years. And so that as we're keeping rights of way, and as we're looking at some of those uh, arterial collector streets. The transportation's been talked about a number of times tonight. Um, I think those are the type of things that, you know, we talked about, we only have one big sewer line coming down, you know, from the north, and to put a second one in is millions of dollars, but we also have to uh, look at, think about things I believe in, in the long term and in the long range, and what are the best decisions uh, that we can possibly make for the community going forward. You know, just to talk about things haven't changed in the almost 30 years that I've been doing development in this town, things have changed immensely from how we deal with the environment, all for the better, the way we deal with stormwater, the impacts on the environment uh, are different. Can they continue to be improved? Absolutely, but things are way different. Uh, when we used to think about putting the big pipes in the ground so we could get rid of the water as fast as we could, and now we pond the water so that it stays on the site. We do different kind of rain gardens and the way we deal with stormwater uh, in general, very important, but is also radically different than what it was uh, 30 years ago. 
So uh, I applaud the way the process has uh, been laid out and um, good luck with your decisions. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Mark Harmison, uh, 2060 <laughs> South 500th Avenue, which is the County Line Road. Uh, just felt like couldn't let the developers have the last word. <laughs> um, <laughs> The main point I'd like to urge you to consider is, you know, all of these things are going to ultimately involve some sort of annexation. Um, most of us who live in rural settings now probably aren't real excited about annexation, particularly if it involves large tax increases without getting any services in return. Two or three years ago, when there was some discussion around the Southwest growth priority area, you know, I asked, I don't remember who it was, whether it was Kelly or somebody else at the time, you know, they said, well, yeah, your taxes will go up by about 50%. And I said, what do I get in return for that? Crickets, right? I don't get gas because that's the utility distribution. I don't get electric because that's utility distribution. We're thinking maybe we'll just let the sheriff keep doing the sheriff thing so I don't get police. I don't get to lower my insurance rates because I'm still going to get covered by Kelly Volunteer Fire Department. I'm not going to get a road because that's 10 or 20 years down the road before they pave my gravel. I don't get, maybe I'll get to hook up to our sewer system at a cost of $10,000. When I do get the road, maybe I'll, it'll cost me thirty or $40,000 to get the road. So I guess what I'd ask is when you consider annexing parts of this land, do it in proportion to the services you're able to provide immediately. Don't just annex a bunch of land to square off the boundaries of the city because it looks nice on the map. If you're not going to pave my road, if you're not going to give me utilities, fire protection, police protection, don't annex me and raise my taxes either. The other point, just real quickly, my property has Whirly Creek running through it. Um, I'm not sure what's going to happen to the flooding of that if you develop all around me. I know if I wanted to develop something in the floodplain, I have to go through enormous hoops to do that. I just got finished looking into it. I hope that you all are as careful about flooding me out as I have to be about flooding my neighbors out because <laughs> I don't want to get, I don't want to get flooded out either. So thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Lawrence? Uh, Laura Solson, 1705 Buchanan. Also, I'm here to speak to a little bit of the history that I know as a Story County supervisor. And this did not occur to me to say it until I listened to a couple of discussion. The discussion turned toward um, Hyde Avenue and 190th. And what kicked in my mind then with any expansion to the north or the northwest is an issue that we, the Story County Supervisors Board about a year and a half ago or two years ago discussed. And I just want to reemphasize about pay attention to where that traffic flow is going to be. Infrastructure, not only Hyde, I live on Eisenhower, so I'm with you on that, okay? Um, and we did look at Hyde, as you know, we, we had our engineer send a letter, but North Dakota is a problem also. Um, and that's what I'm going to reference that the previous Board of Supervisors we looked at. And the traffic count on North Dakota already is over a thousand a day. We cannot widen it per our engineer because those are steep ditches. And there's nowhere to really, I mean, to annex, all we'd be annexing would be a lot, a huge bill to go ahead and do infill to try and widen that. So once again, my urge is wherever you go um, to pay attention to what maybe is already there. And with that, I'll segue into the east side and just want to remind you, as I did last meeting, okay, afterwards, uh, Kettleson March is there. So please be careful if you're looking at expansion to the east, aware that you have have um, uh, some natural area there that the county owns, okay, but that is very sensitive and how would you impact that? I do understand in listening to people that the east side might offer you some straight transportation lines and open open line to put in wide streets, but um, I think that with Prairie View there, et cetera, the development might not go the way you want. So thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else?
Okay, we'll close public comment at this point in time. Um, Kelly, can you, there's a couple of people have talked about, you know, pending annexation requests coming, you know, next week. And I just want to make sure that if you just share what process they go through. And the fact is that we're not trying to do a bait and switch that all of a sudden, boom, we're doing annexation, you know, next week or being asked to annex. And the point is, um, I don't think council's that involved really with that. That's really done with staff. Is that correct? You can explain that process and what we can expect on that. So we, we received a, a voluntary annexation petition for the Champlin farm property off of Dartmoor that was described to you. Uh, once that application uh, was determined to be complete, the first step is to bring it to council to decide whether you want to proceed with that process. It's a discretionary process to annex land. So on the 14th, what you're being asked by the Champlin applicants is to is to kick off the public hearing process. Uh, roughly a year ago, you had a similar request. And, and you said, put it on hold. We want to understand some of the McKay land of the West and other issues that would go along with maybe broader annexation policy. And, and you said, ultimately, to to, ha to the Champlains, you should proceed with just your with your own property. There's no other pending properties here to combine you with. So that's what you're going to be asked on next Tuesday is to start the public hearing process. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> And if, if the follow on that to that was the current land use policy plan designates that area as an urban service area. So if you choose to proceed, you're going to be following the current <coughs> land use policy plan, which is your adopted policy of the city. Uh, the, the potential of adopting a new plan is likely not a factor in your decision um, other than maybe from a timing perspective. Well, I think that council is very sensitive to being forthright, transparent, and not trying to, you know, come across as saying, oh, we'll ask for your input, but then we're going to, you know, approve annexation. The point is, is that it's just coincidental. And you're right, we, the Champlin, I'm sorry, the uh, McKay property was uh, talked about, you know, yeah, previously. And, and one thing that's a struggle with this exercise is this doesn't depict the current land use policy plan. There's other areas in South Ames that are shown as urban service areas. Uh, there's areas shown in, in West Ames that overlap and some of these others don't have urban services here. So it doesn't necessarily match everything that's in the current plan. This was again, an exercise as, as uh, Mr. Halleck put it, it, it's creating straw men. It's showing you what would happen. Is not necessarily the one you would pick, but it shows you what would happen. Yeah. And if, as we move to preferred land use plans, we'll start to pick up some of those other properties that, that we assume if, if the Champlins move ahead with the annexation request and you do that, obviously we'll show that as part of the city to be consistent with, with the direction that that's headed along with some other uh, fringe properties that are just too small on their own to be part of a scenario, but would be logical components mm -hmm. of the city. Okay. All right, council. Um, haven't had much time to really talk as council in terms of just things we've been uh, being exposed to. So there's an opportunity to kind of just start the conversation. And um, Mayor, how do you want us to proceed? I mean, there are a lot of different directions we could go. Do you want us to um, sort of in a uh, without any particular plan, just go through and just start responding to things we've heard? Do you want us to ask questions what what do you have in mind for this segment well i don't i did not anticipate that this would be a people ask questions and we answer the questions because i think they've asked there's a number of questions some that staff can ask as well too i mean I can answer um i think what i'm interested in is just having an open conversation amongst council in terms of you know we've been through several workshops uh, i asked kelly to put this out this is like a you know just the four, four or five scenarios have been you know, talked about. There's no decision obviously made. The other thing, too, is that, Kelly, can you throw up that tier one, two, three? Um, we also talked about the fact that that, uh, I call it the, uh, the light blue, that tier one. Actually, why don't you, Kelly, why don't you explain what those tiers are for, the, for those that may not be aware of it? Right. So in the, in the presentation in December, we walked through each growth area in detail and tried to break it. Uh, down into pieces that could be logically served by the same in infrastructure investment. So you could kind of see some logical breakpoints about where you would have a next leap in a, either a service delivery or something that needs to happen. 
uh, that was significant and it just wouldn't necessarily be incremental. Uh, so blue was viewed as near term, meaning it's either consistent with existing policy, easy to develop, maybe already has uh, infrastructure available, would have a lower cost or had a very quick timeline where it could be done if the city chose to do that. Tier two was obviously just a little bit more costly or maybe a little bit more down the line because there was a gap you needed to do tier one first to get to it. So those progressions uh, it, aren't meant to be linear necessarily. It doesn't necessarily mean that all blue has to be done to get to green, but green obviously needed something to happen before it could happen. So that's why it became two. Three is definitely a larger infrastructure cost. Something meaningful has to be done to open up those lands for development and tier four uh, was was also a very substantial investment. Uh, and as I said before, probably a, something that's near the end of the plan or maybe looking into the next phase of planning for the city. Um, one thing that we I think we reiterated a number of times is that the tiers are not to be intended to be a sequencing plan. It was meant to help guide different parts of the city that might be able to be developed easier than others. And then we also suggested during that presentation that just looking at the the blue, while it would accommodate almost all of the population projection, it doesn't really set you up for a future. It, it sets you up for incremental development, but doesn't really necessarily have a vision in and of itself because it's spread out in so many different ways. Um, so you might choose to do all of that. You might choose to do that plus others to try and reach other goals beyond just where do I put 15,000 people? Well, and it depends on willing landowners too, right? So that was a question Correct. that was raised by a number of people in the audience tonight. And I think it's important to, to note that we're, it's not our goal to start annexing against people's will, right? So uh, if we are, you know, if we're getting a voluntary annexation, for example, that happens to fit within one of the growth areas, like that's how that works in, into the future. Um, it's, I don't think it would be any of our goals to, uh, to overreach that. So again, you know, so a couple of people mentioned that tonight. Well, how many willing landowners might you have in an area? And I think that's meant to be factored in, in that in the blue, say, some of those landowners might be willing to annex and some might not. And so we couldn't expect to ab absorb into all of the blue because we have landowners in that territory that aren't going to be willing to annex or to sell. And so that's I, that's part of it too. And I just want to touch on that because a couple of you who made comments kind of mentioned that annexation um, and expansion issue. And um, that's how, at least that's how I see it uh, more likely progressing is yeah. people who are in those, pro in those areas who are looking to sell or develop or annex. Ron and I, I would just want to say though that we are one council and this sure. plan goes for 20 years. That's so I'd be very hesitant to promise anybody that a future council would not want to annex something against the wishes of the landowners. Sure. Well, I didn't say I promise, but no, no, I, no but I mean, I, I think it's, I, I think it's sort of short sighted of us to, to see this as, um, you know, the benevolence here that we maybe possess not wanting to annex against landowners will is something that is confined to our interests and not any future council. So. Well, I think it's safe to say that eminent domain is not going to be used. Yes. Yeah. I think that was, that, that was brought up and Kelly, <clears throat> if someone wants, if, if the city wanted to annex a portion of ground, there's a certain percentage of landowners that have to be willing to consent. Is that correct? Yeah, so within a voluntary annexation, there is the 80-20 rule, which allows a city to add 20% additional territory, uh, whether they've consented or not to the process for the purpose of, of <clears throat> filling islands, uh, making logical boundaries. You don't have jagged edges or so jurisdictional issues are, are readily apparent. You don't really want a, a, a jigsaw puzzle of who's responding on a roadway, the sheriff or the city police department, because one house is in or out. So those those ideas are embedded in state law that for for some reasons you can do 80-20 uh, to, to have logical boundaries and to avoid islands. And is there a mechanism for less than eight, you can less do zero. than 80? I mean, you can do zero non-consenting. You can have 100% consenting. Right, but you couldn't do... 100% non-consent. So the, a whole separate process called involuntary annexation, which we have not done. Right. So uh, that's, is, we don't have a history of doing that. We don't have a history. Yeah. There's, there's, a, it's, it's not something that's typically done. Right. Yeah. No, that's what I, that's what I mean is that, mm -hmm. yeah, 
yeah. That we can't just come There's. take people's land. I mean, the 80 20 thing that, I mean, there is that. All right. So <clears throat> I believe that was shared with council at one of the workshops that one option might be picking tier one in all four locations in terms of being an opportunity, but then you still want to have the ability to say in what direction, north, south, east, or west, so that can be further developed by the consultant. Is that correct? I, I think that's the choices you have to decide. If, if you're gonna, I mean, we calculated out kind of those service populations in, in the blue, in the green, so you can understand if you just picked one, where could you stop? So I think that's the question for council is, is if you're happy with the, with the service populations that are planned for infill plus the blues and that you're going to call it a day, you can call it a day. If you, if you want to move to say there's going to be a progression in one direction or another, that's what we need to know to move forward with, with additional planning about housing and land, land use options. And for infill, we will hear more about that, right? Our infill Correct. So the there. only thing that you've seen on infill is uh, was a very limited exercise where we identified uh, as staff for you, six, I think roughly six areas, a lot of us based on the Lincoln Way corridor plan, and said, we assume that you would bring forward the infill areas discussed in the corridor plan. Uh, we highlighted uh, some areas south of campus town as, as a potential area to maybe think about infill. Currently, that's not really an option in that area. So if that's a policy to look at, we looked at more development on, on East Lincoln Way as a possibility. Uh, the South Lincoln mixed use area around third and fourth was a highlighted area. Uh, obviously, we're going to support investment in downtown and campus town going forward. But other than that, there wasn't a whole lot of other sites to just say a whole lot of change could happen. Um, so we looked at a couple of smaller pieces on corners and other places where, where maybe small projects could happen. Um, so there's there's more to discuss there about maybe policy about what you're willing to consider in the future. Our suggestion was that because infill is so difficult uh, to predict and it's very costly and time consuming, it's hard to say, well, I'm going to just say 25% of our population growth will be in infill. So let's subtract that off the top and let's reduce the, the pattern of growth. We can do that. Uh, but it really limits then or puts a lot of pressure on trying to figure out infill development and you get to the same conversations. Who's the willing seller? Who's not? How do you, how do you combine properties? The same conversation you have about farmland happens in the city as well. Uh, and I think you've heard about this. We've seen this in the downtown gateway area. It's not an easy exercise to go through. It can be very productive and beneficial, but it isn't necessarily easy. Yeah. Thank you. So Tim, back to your question, that is council's being asked to give some direction to staff next, um, Tuesday night. And so what matrix is going to be used? What criteria is going to be used to arrive at a decision and direction? And it was my thinking that tonight would be an open opportunity in front of the public, you know, to have that conversation since we don't, we can't deliberate. We don't deliberate behind closed doors. We don't do it you know, offline. So this is an opportunity just to kind of have, you know, what are some of the concerns you have? You know, you, <coughs> um, obviously we heard a lot about farm ground. We heard a lot about, uh, um, walkability, obviously, um, sustainability, climate change, uh, all those pieces, you know, fit into there. Um, I, I do think that we are, as was mentioned, <laughs> we are victims of not planning ahead and who hasn't driven out on George Washington Carver going north and a two lane road and all that traffic out there. I mean, it just wasn't planned for same for Hyde as well too. So this is what I think staff is trying to do is trying to say, if we're going to pick an area to really focus on, then the infrastructure, the roads, the sewers, water, all that pieces will be planned accordingly to kind of handle anticipated traffic and growth in the future. Um, but it's a big decision. And, uh, um, I just think conversation is important and get your ideas out there. And, um, and staff has not given us necessarily a matrix to know how to decide. That's up to the council to decide how you want to, what, what direction do you want to go? So we gave you that, that cover memo with the uh, workshop on the 19th, where again, it's not a scoring rubric for everything, but it did highlight some of the things that have come up in the past nine months. So one thing that's always, I feel like we always forget about is we have a lot of public input. 
It's not just tonight. You had kickoff meetings with people that had visionary ideas for the city. You've had people weigh in on the online commenting tool for the scenarios as well. So there's there's input that to be had, not just what's said tonight. And we've tried to distill that into that memo about different reasons that you might pick one over the other. There's not, there's absolutely not one area that meets the, the 10 different bullets that we put in there. Um, it's it's going to be a factor of what your priorities are. What's the vision for how we do things and where we do things. And just for public's information, everything that council gets is online. So if you're interested in looking at it, all you got to do is go to, I think it's mayor and city council. You can go down to the meetings um, so tab. We, it's simpler than that. Everything that we give you, we just put back on the Ames Plan 2040 uh, webpage. So you don't, oh, that's right. go, right. that's you don't have to go dig into the council <laughs> meetings to find it. If you want to see the minutes, those are there. We don't post the right. minutes, but all of the right. presentation materials are on our page. So the memo that Kelly's referring to, is available online. Yep, it's it's embedded in the presentation PDF that's out there. There's a lot of helpful information. If if you've just come to this conversation, just know we've been at this for a while, and you can come up to speed pretty quickly by uh, going through some of those workshops and presentations that are on the website. You know, even though we've been at this for a while, there were a couple of things that came up tonight which I am surprised I had not even considered. And those were specifically related to ag uses. Um, the Having grown up on a farm, I am aware of what it's like to live near intensive um, agricultural uses of various kinds. And yet I had not been thinking at all in terms of what happens if we are near the poultry farm or the hog farm. The poultry farm used to be kitty corner to where my house is. It used to be where the tower's residence halls are. And so the poultry farm used to be right in town. And my husband still remembers all the complaints of the neighbors because of the smells from the poultry farm. And so it's somewhat amazing to me that we haven't actually heard about any of those potential negative agricultural impacts on a development into the Iowa State properties. And I am appalled that I didn't even consider that as I'm looking at this map, which has no agricultural smell associated with it or noises or slow farming implements or anything else that's related to ag uses. And so that to me was something that I really appreciate people bringing forward because I do think that's something that needs to be factored into at least my thinking on where we grow. So, I mean, I think in a general sense it was, I think the old, the 97 plan had a little bit more land in the Southwest thinking that we would fill in that land and then keep going south or southwest. I think we've been very, very clear that other than probably the Champlin property, um, Whirly Creek's kind of that line. We don't really see marching south as as the direction of the city. We've been very clear message from ISU that that's, that ag science corridor is the ag science corridor and they don't feel like that's going to be displaced anytime soon. So is there a... So in that sense, yes, we've we've tried to limit showing land in the south, but there isn't necessarily when you're looking at these growth areas the level of detail to to, to I guess for us to just write off an area because it's within 2,000 feet of a of a of a research farm or or something else. That's something we would have to hear back as you develop land use policies about whether that's really an area you would be interested in annexing if you don't think it's desirable for residential development. Mm -hmm. I think one of the challenges too for people probably look around and say, man, it seems like there's a lot of land available in the city. But when you factor in floodways where you can't build, right? You cannot build on a floodway. Floodway cannot have structures. So, and we have quite a bit of floodway along Skunk River so it, and some along Squaw Creek. And then we also have um, a lot of land is owned by Iowa State University and um, we respect the fact that they want to have close proximity from the classroom to the farm for, you know, educational purposes. And uh, they've not, we have posed that question and right now they're not interested in really 
divesting themselves of any land. And then we do have the land, as mentioned tonight, and, we, and we're aware of that as well, too, because uh, staff provided documents showing where there is uh, Iowa State farm ground you know, around there as well, too. So, but I think, can you go back to the infill for a second? Because that was a question is that my understanding was from our conversation is that it's going to be very difficult to come back in and start doing whole scale infill to try and meet the needs of uh, you know increased population. Yes, we can meet some, but it's not like we can go ahead and accommodate 50% or 80% of that growth without coming in and clear cutting what is probably affordable housing <laughs> or housing which is going to be entry level housing because the property is going to be less money to purchase in order to try and amalgamate that. And it's going to be difficult, as Kelly alluded to, to try and buy even one block. You might have a dozen or more homeowners. So can you talk about that just for a second? Yeah, so I, I just pulled this up from the December presentation. So my graphic I have that kind of talks about infill a little bit. So in the center of the city, you see a little bit of a blue pattern and a little bit of orange. The, the orange or beige areas are the specific areas that RDG showed you just a concept. Uh, again, there was no absolute direction from council. Yes, we want high density. We want commercial. It was just an exercise to help you understand what's there. And the blue are kind of other areas that, that fit the idea of either vacant or underutilized land, things that we had talked about or maybe are already in the LUPP. So you can see it's really focused on Lincoln Way and you don't see a whole lot else anywhere in the city. Uh, so if, if you're thinking project-based redevelopment, it seems that it's in the center and it's in the core of the city on Lincoln Way, which makes a ton of sense. That's the same conclusion the corridor plan reached. Those other areas are different not to crack. Uh, and what are you looking uh, to really do there? And how can you really retrofitting single family subdivisions that aren't square, don't have alleys? It's, it's a chore. It's a difficulty that I don't think very many people have been successful with. Uh, it's, it's, it's something that's been talked about quite a bit in the planning circles for 20 years. It's just, there's no obvious panacea to retrofitting suburbia. Mm -hmm. um, and we have a lot of that, especially in North Ames. So this graphic was meant to show you that if you picked uh, tier one, had 15,000 people that could be served in those areas. Plus if you put a, plus the infill would be kind of the, the extra on top. If, if you were to focus on the infill, I think what you start to see is then you would probably pull a tier one area out of the equation, or you would definitely not start to look at tier two because you would be investing. Uh, that's going to be a core question. Are you investing internally to facilitate redevelopment? Are you investing on the perimeter to support additional development? One way or the other, the city is going to have to make investments. And that's going to be that core question that comes back to is where your priority for investment internal or on the perimeter or both, but in a balanced manner. And that, that really is an important point because that's why we're doing this plan to begin with. I mean, we don't have to adopt a new uh, comprehensive plan. We could just stay status quo, but it doesn't allow us to make key and thoughtful uh, infrastructure investments in the future. So we, we just be sort of a haphazard approach. So I appreciate that point very much. Um, Mayor, if I could make just uh, a, sort of a broad comment about growth. Now that come up, came up several times tonight. Um, a little bit of perspective on the state. Um, two thirds of our counties are not growing, they're declining um, in population. And we happen to be in an area where the, the population is increasing. And so the question really isn't so much whether we're gonna grow, the question in my mind is how are we going to do it? Are we gonna do it in a responsible and a thoughtful manner? And how do we mitigate sort of the negative externalities and facilitate this growth. Um, not planning, I think, is going to create a more, uh, increase the chances of environmental damage that you don't want. I think if we, we plan thoughtfully, uh, we can better mitigate that. But um, I, think, I think that growth is gonna happen. And if, if we said, we're just gonna put a, a ring around Ames and say though, there shouldn't be any more growth, that's gonna push uh, this population to other communities. They'll be happy to have the residents, it'll encourage um, rural subdivisions, which are harder for us to incorporate. So I, I'm not a huge fan of rural subdivisions in terms of the relationship with the city. So I'd, I'd rather plan for that increased growth um, within a, 
a thoughtful, comprehensive plan rather than in a haphazard fashion. Just general comments. Okay, thank you. I mean, I tend to agree. I'm curious what we'll see more on infill because I mean, I think there's the project-based infill concept where you have like a, a whole series of lots and you, you make something bigger there and it intensifies the density. But then, I mean, there's other concepts we've talked about and I, I, I'm curious, you know, what kind of effect they have long-term. I realize it's not a short-term effect, but you know, maybe allowing uh, multiple units on a lot if you have a certain lot size or um, smaller unit sizes allowed than we have in the past. So the, you know, the concept of the tiny homes, you hear about a lot about that these days and, th you know, things like that. So uh, changing what we allow within the current city limits will give us some infill too, in a way that's different from the project based stuff, I think. And I, I'm hearing that that's not fast acting by any means, you know, because it's, um, for one, it depends on willing property owners to make those sort of investments and things like that. But I think it's important that we say that, that that's important and we try to go for some figure or goal there when it comes to infill because I wholeheartedly agree with what's been said about sustainability. And by 2040, we don't know what things are going to look like. You know, in turn, to plan for things to be status quo is short-sighted, I think. So so now to say, yes, we want to focus on infill, even though it's going to be harder, um, I think is valuable. There's some value in that. Yeah. I, I mean, we talked about this. I don't, I mean, the material on the infill workshop is fantastic. Very worthwhile people to read that. I, I seem to remember like when you brought this up before that we're not going to be able to realize a ton of uh, increased population. But what I loved about that infill presentation is that uh, there's really not as much gentrification as I was afraid of. Uh, there are areas where we could put uh, <clears throat> substantial uh, development without uh, destroying neighborhoods. And that was very exciting to me. And uh, so if people have an interest in that, I encourage them to look at that. But I, I agree with you. I think, there's, I think we need to have a substantial part of this plan being infill. So just for anybody that's wondering, December 4th is the meeting where, where you had some slides about the, the work helpful. RDG did on the on infill options. It was also the initial discussion of land use policy. Yeah. And those were kind of the more project-based, uh, where you, yeah, where you yeah. picked an area. They're, they're area-based, yeah. 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 Just like the corridor plan, what we tried to do in the corridor plan was depict not that everything's a four or five-story building everywhere. What are different ways to incorporate housing types? Uh, so some of those don't or you wouldn't expect someone to acquire five properties to do, it might be one or two properties to do it versus something in downtown gateway where we were talking about acquiring three or four acres to do a project. Yeah. I, I would just be careful. And Tim, I hear you use, use the word a substantial portion of the, of the growth. I think you said something like a substantial well, portion. And the point is, is that I don't want to give the wrong impression because I think with staff and RDG have cautioned is that that is very, very difficult to, plan or because it's going to rely heavily on the person who owns that property to do something you're trying to amalgamate it versus having a piece of property which you can I mean, purchase. I mean we also have you know um what on south cedar that land has been brought into voluntarily annexed in looking at doing some development there um that's fair and i apologize I, no not maybe the, no the wording is is very important tonight uh but i I do think development has to be a right. at least to say an important component of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. I don't think anyone disagrees with the mm -hmm. fact that the importance of infill is just more or less just don't want to set expectations that we're going to hit a majority of that target is mm -hmm. going to be accomplished. I think that's at least that's how I heard staff and RDG saying was was reasonable. Um, Mayor, if I could speak to the issue of flooding, mm -hmm. um, this was something I learned when I got on council. I presumed that development equaled an increase propensity for flooding because of surface water issues. And it was very intriguing for me to learn that that's not necessarily the case, that there are many examples in Ames where uh, development happened and we actually significantly improved the surface water uh, concerns. Southdale is a, is a great example of that. And that's turning out to be a real case study in how development on the west side of 69 because the ability to capture water um, and improve the size of some of the 
uh, piping is really going to have some great benefits for Southdale. So um, if, if you had that same uh, conception that development equaled an increased challenge to, to surface water flooding, it may not be the case. So that's, that's a good thing to remind people of. So there, is there additional information that you need from staff or from the consultant to assist in digesting what we've heard tonight and going through and look on these plans in order to come to a uh, recommendation? I mean, I think it's important that we obviously take what we've heard tonight, but also take the, I don't know, didn't the RDG say there were 300 or so comments that mm -hmm. we've received? Yep. Online. And all in the yep, and yeah. uh, the the public input documents being updated. We sh we should have that available for you by the end of the week. Okay. Uh, with with that, so when you see it on the fourteenth, and that's just a rolling right. document started from February of last year. And every time we have a new kind of major addition, we we have um, RDG update that and we republish it. Uh, one thing I want to talk about the floodplain. I think um, it was easier for planning staff and RDG in the growth areas. It's always easy when there's very little th few things in the way. Um, so we showed large greenways, right? We're, we're going to respect the floodplain with new development. We're not going to uh, probably do some of the things that were done before. Uh, the harder things are going to be the questions you're going to have to deal with about, about not the floodway, which you can't touch, but what about some of those fringe areas that are already have in development along them? Uh, what other uh, properties might incrementally be beneficial to be developed to meet a commercial development goal or a housing goal? or maybe not because open space is more important than that. So uh, so infill, we didn't touch the floodplain issue. That's something council will have to give direction on. We left the floodplain alone and basically all of our efforts. If you go all the way back to March, I believe, uh, maybe it was the first week of April, we gave you an existing conditions kind of summary and we had a vacant lands inventory included in that and we tabulated vacant lands in and out of the floodplain. And um, it gives you an idea of how little commercial land is really in the city unless you were to to reconsider our policies on, on um, floodplain fringe options. So uh, it's gonna be a meaningful issue as you go forward. It hasn't been directive on, on necessarily the scenarios, but it's something that the land use plan will have to include as, as more direct language or consistent language anyways on what we expect around um, Squaw Creek and, and Skunk River and the other waterways we might grow into. Kelly, I know that you want to keep this process going. And I, uh, my understanding, this is, this is a really important decision because once this decision is made, it's going to really direct staff and, and RDG. And obviously this couldn't be a worse time for council from a standpoint, we're getting into budget, we're getting into CIP, we're getting into, I mean, we got meetings almost every night, you know, going on, you know, in early, in early February. Can you comment? I mean, if council talked about this further next Tuesday night, but just decided they just really aren't ready to make a decision, what would a two week postponement or even a month postponement? Cause I think, I think we, we all don't want to do what happened 19 years ago and make a decision and then find out six months later after it's been adopted that, oops, we start undoing it. We want to make sure it's, it's, we get it right and we have a good process. And uh, you just comment on that. I'm not trying to put it, I'm not trying to throw a monkey wrench into it, but I think that there's a lot. And, you know, Councilman Martin um, is not here tonight. He's going to watch the video, but uh, he had a plan, you know, time getting away. We, we dropped this meeting in so we could try and get yep. public input. But there's just a lot here and we're not, we're not, uh, I don't think any of us are really <coughs> experts in this area like you guys are. So, so I think, um, and, and Corey's here as well, if, if there's a specific question for RDG, but I, I think, uh, we obviously want you to be comfortable with the direction you give us because it, it isn't the end of the planning process, but we're going to put a lot around that. And when we go out to the public, we, we want to believe it was a reasonable approach to start with, not something that we're gonna pull back and say, you're right, that was really not a great idea. We didn't mean that. Uh, obviously the public comment period is to refine it. Uh, so, so you shouldn't feel that if, that if you give us direction next week uh, and you're pretty confident about it, that that's not good enough because there will be changes that come through the process. If you're not comfortable waiting to the 28th, uh, waiting till after budget on February 11th, 
obviously it'll just kind of string out when we can bring right. materials back to you. If you go to the 28th, we probably won't be able to bring you a full-fledged uh, preferred land use plan and all the land use categories on the 18th, but we can have a, a topical meeting like we did on December 4th to at least keep plan 2040 in our minds and talk about some of the issues that might influence that, but we probably won't be able to get as much done on February 18th. And, and it'll just cascade back a little bit on that. So I, th I think you have time if the 14th feels rushed uh, or there's questions left to be answered. We'd rather know that than, than spend time on something you're not really confident in. Well, I greatly appreciate everyone coming in and giving input. I think council greatly benefited from the different perspectives. There's a lot to digest. And I just, I mean, it's a, it's a council decision that, you know, this is something that I'm going to really look to council because you got to support it, you know, going down the road. Um, but I always find that having a matrix or some kind of a way to think through <laughs> different pieces. And I, I don't, I have nothing to share tonight that would really help guide that conversation at this point. And I just think that, I mean, the key I, mean I, th I think staff has done a great job. I think RDG has done a really good you know, job in the last, you know, a few months, as you mentioned, the, the infill was a good session. The 19th was a very good session, but um, I just hate to see council hurry through this to try and stay on a schedule where maybe a month or maybe a few weeks is going to benefit and give you more time to really digest it. But that's, if council wants to make a decision on the 14th and move forward, that's your, some of your prerogative. But I just throw that out as being, um, and I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts on that too, before we wind up tonight. Mayor, there, there were two other topics and I'd like to get the, the council's input if we want to spend a little time about it. Um, I just feel like if there are a number of people that raised issues i feel like if you want us to to respond i'd like i maybe it would be giving just a little bit of response to concerns about transportation and climate i mean these these are heartfelt issues for a lot of the people who spoke tonight um and maybe i'll start with the transportation piece and then someone can pick up on climate component <laughs> um the city went through a pretty robust process on the complete streets and uh, we adopted that uh, plan unanimously and so um, that is baked into the expectation for uh, the comprehensive plan. So um, we are committed to making sure that, that the priorities expressed in complete streets would be included in new developments. Um, one of the people asked about SciRide, and that's a much trickier piece to work through um, because SciRide is stretched right now. And so, um, I don't think it's, no one up here is going to promise that we can provide uh, SciRide service to all these areas from day one. And so we need to have a realistic conversation about SciRide. And that does impact some of these areas, but in terms of walkability, um, uh, the multi-use trails uh, and, and roads that are designed for complete streets, I, I think we're all on the same page with respect to the importance of that. So if people are worried about that, I, I, I don't have that concern. So I can give you one little tidbit since we met. I think you mentioned transit meeting with SciRide at your last, on, on December 19th. So we did have a preliminary meeting with SciRide on, um, on, I think on Friday to kind of talk through, it had been a few months since they had looked at this as well. So I, I don't have any final answers for you, but especially when we get to preferred land use, we can give you better answers about service costs. Uh, we might be able to get, SciRide might be able to estimate some ideas or some costs, like if you had to run another mile of service. Mm -hmm. What is that going to cost uh, um, from a budgetary standpoint? Uh, those w we can give you some maybe cost to serve per mile kind of figures, but it's really hard to guess right now. Where are those people going? Does East Industrial exist when they're getting on the bus or not? Is everybody riding the bus to ISU or to City Hall or not? So it's we're going to have to make some very basic assumptions, just like we did with everything else. So you have a little bit of comparison. It's very hard to predict transit ridership. The, the travel time is just as important as um, uh, the total travel time as cost. Uh, there's just a lot of factors. We, we had a good session kind of talking it through about what are some things that in the state of the industry, how do you factor this in? It's not clear on what for a city like Ames, how do you predict increase in transit ridership? Um, and this plan can't do that. We're not a transit ridership study. SciRide 2.0 is a great great plan for what the service need was or is for the community from two years ago. 
it doesn't necessarily mean that's what it is in 2040. Uh, we'll we'll try it, especially on the preferred land use. I think we can give you better answers about how serviceability planning for transit is is definitely in our minds. It's going to be a budgetary issue about how do you pay for bus service. That that's really what it's going to come down to. It's not a question of can you serve it. It's just can you afford to serve it. Okay. And want to talk about climate sustainability? No. What are you looking for? And I just, yeah, I mean, it's people, important. People were concerned about having this be a component, and I just feel like we should at least talk a little bit about this because people were concerned about it. Well, so I, I can give the same backdrop I gave everybody on the nineteenth. Just again for people that didn't weren't here, the city has committed to uh, kind of a at least a two-step process at this point on on evaluating greenhouse gas emissions from the city. So the city has hired Pale Blue Dot to prepare a GHE greenhouse gas inventory so we can identify our sectors that we individually as a community have a high level of contribution to and maybe that'll lead to a climate action plan to look at ways to reduce emissions in, in different by sector uh, and what we said is with with the process that we're doing in parallel we don't want to amend the comp plan necessarily but if you establish a goal in the climate action plan, we would want to bring that back into the comprehensive plan if it's if it's directed at how land use is done. If we ad adopt an emissions target reduction goal for the city and it's it's about activities the city does or what people do and it isn't necessarily land use based or then maybe there isn't a substantial comp plan amendment to deal with that. But that's where we are at this point. Um, as that study gets done, more information comes available. If this gets drug out longer, then maybe things get embedded sooner. Uh, if if you are to take a different take on this and say, no, we're going to reverse course a little bit, or at least take a detour and tell RDG and city staff that a climate threshold is the priority for making decisions on scenarios, that's a huge thing that we need to know in January. Because up until now, that has not been your direction. That's one of those just has to be known because it changes what we will give back to you as information. So I was going to observe that um, <clears throat> when I think about the issues that were raised with regard to sustainability and climate change, it seems to me that a number of them fall into the category of us deciding philosophically how we're weighting these issues. Um, how do we factor in alternative transportation modes? Does that weigh more heavily or less heavily than something else? Um, how do we factor in the, the weight of transit concerns? Is the Cyride availability going to be a, a deal breaker for some of these areas or not? Um, how are we weighting the climate change and sustainability issues in our decision making going forward. And I don't know if that's a council discussion or if that's an individual council member decision where we're all making our own judgments based on what we think is the most important of the categories and weighting those issues ourselves. But obviously we've got some philosophical decisions to make, whether we make them as a council or whether we make them individually. Um, I think that I heard some other things that fall into that same category. Um, do we value the retaining of the integrity of localities? You know, is it important to us that Gilbert can remain Gilbert or that Franklin Township still exists? I don't know if that's important to us. Do our plans that we have in place now, the urban fringe plan, um, historic preservation plan comes to mind because we got an email about um, a preservation issue with some of our infill. Do the plans that we currently have reflect our current values or are they in need of updating alongside the comprehensive plan? And I also heard some um, concerns about how the timing of a build out may impact people. So for example, rural residents, if we can't do a build out 
um, to provide all of the services immediately, are we unnecessarily burdening them immediately with annexation and making them pay more when they aren't getting anything for, I don't know, 10 years? Or in that same category, how does, for example, the um, existence of an interchange or the building of that interchange and the timing of that building weigh into our decision making? Is it okay for us to expand to the south and say, we hope we're going to have an interchange on 35 at some point in the future, but we don't know when that'll be? Or do we say, well, no, we're going to go for things now. We weigh it more heavily that we already have the access. We already have the, um, the tier one um, amenities and infrastructure and police and fire services and everything else. So all of those, I think, are things that we have to be considering, but I don't know whether we consider them together or not. Well, the goal has been to work as a unified board and over the last two years, you've certainly demonstrated that even though you don't always agree, I mean, the point is you've had a lot of conversation. And uh, well, I think that obviously every individual is gonna have their own opinion. I do think that it's, there's tremendous benefit to talking about it and um, coming to a consensus, you know, as you move forward. Um, I hate to have you just come in and all start voting on things without having talked about it or coming to a unified, um, you know, consensus, you know, as a body, as a elected body, representative the body. All right. Um, I had put down on the agenda public comment and follow-up questions, but I think that's going to, I think we had good public comment and follow-up. I, um, no, no, I'll, um, I'd like to talk to staff the next day or so and then put on the agenda whether or not a decision is going to be made on the 14th and then the public can see if there's going to be, because I think that if we're going to make a decision, the public needs to have the opportunity to make additional input. And I don't want to pull the rug out from underneath them. Um, I have to honestly say I'm, I, I, I'm a little hesitant asking council to make a decision next Tuesday night because there's a lot that we've really you got to wrestle with, but I would, uh, we can have some just conversations offline as well too, in terms of what, what your sense is and what your feeling is. Um, but we will, we will put on the agenda. Um, whether or not we're going to go ahead and make a decision or just discussion only on the 14th. Then we can talk about that with Kelly you know, I can, and Steve can talk about that. I don't want to go into that meeting and having people not knowing if we're going to make a decision or not coming expecting to give input. And if it's just discussion, maybe there's no input that night um, just so we can go ahead. Cause I'm not even sure what all's on the agenda that evening as well, too. And we're trying to make sure that we manage agenda. So we're not here, you know, for extremely long council meetings. Um, I don't, what is can you just state what you're what, what I don't want to go into back into public comment because if you have a comment then others should have the opportunity to do it. What, what was your question okay thank you and again as councilman Garten said if you go on online you can get all of us you can email if you click on mayor and council or council and mayor all of us get the emails I can assure you we, we read every email we may not respond to every email because sometimes we get a lot of emails but that's a great way to get input um you know to us as well all right any other closing comments or thoughts this evening one more um irv did such a good job of articulating a particular vantage point and one one piece that um i think really deserves some attention he his discussion on the aquifer if i could just speak directly to that um i think it's a really important point and we are paying attention uh, to the demands on the aquifer. Um, the ethanol facility uh, used a huge amount of water from the aquifer. <clears throat> and we really haven't had robust discussions about water use in Iowa. Uh, we've always sort of presumed that we've had abundant, unlimited water. Well, we don't. 
And so in other parts of the country, they have a more established um, approach to, to uh, water utilization. Um, I believe that there's uh, concern about bringing in a high volume water user in the Eastern industrial area. Residential properties don't use a ton of water. Even if you have multiple teenagers, it doesn't really add up to that much. It's, it's the commercial industrial users that provide a huge demand and pull on the aquifer. Mm -hmm. So we are being very sensitive to that. And so I, Irv, I appreciate your comment on that. Uh, it's a good reminder for us to keep that um, on our radar screen. So I appreciate your comments tonight. And I do believe HDR is taken into consideration too. Is that correct, mm -hmm. Kelly? I mean, that is not something which is being ignored. The water we're, capacity. We're taking our cues from WPC about yes. telling us what the treatment plan has capacity for and, and their view of the resource. They have not said that we can't support 15,000 right. people with the aquifer. Right. Now, we're very cognizant of the East Industrial Area about what its impacts are with a high user on treatment expansion as well as water line extensions. But as a, as a source, the 15,000 people and the economic development WPC has said is accommodatable at this point. Okay. All right. Let's move on to Council Commons. Gloria? I don't have any. Jim? Um, just briefly, I am blown away by the number of people who showed up tonight. Um, my fear was there would be like five or six people, and it would be really disappointing. You were wrong. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. And so you guys came, you very, very thoughtful presentations. The conversation doesn't end here. But I just wanted to thank everybody for coming tonight. This just speaks volume for the kind of community we have. And so I know I speak for council just in extending our gratitude for people coming and everybody was very respectful and thoughtful and this is what make aims aim. So thanks for coming tonight. Yeah. Rachel. Yeah. Um, this is my first meeting. So I wanted to thank you all for coming out and giving so much input on the 2040 plan. Um, I want to make myself available to anyone if they want to meet with me or um, have anything they want me to hear as a new council member, I would be more than willing to set up those meetings and hear from people and continue these conversations. Uh, just to piggyback off of what Tim said, getting community feedback on this and really anything that we do is just so critically important. I think anytime I'm in front of a group speaking, I'm almost begging people to send us emails. Um, we do get a lot of emails, but we don't get nearly enough input from the community on things that are critically important to the future. Um, and so it's, I just can't stress enough how important it is that we hear from a broad cross section of the community on this and, and other decisions that we're making. Nothing for me. All right. <clears throat> well, I would, I'm not going to repeat what everyone else said. Thank you for coming. I appreciate that. And there are no dispositions or communications to council, so I entertain a motion to adjourn. Uh, move to adjourn. We're adjourned. Thank you.